All right, guys, welcome back to another project. So in this one, we're going to be making a nice, simple hanging tea cabinet. Now, the goal of this project isn't so much the final piece. And I know that that sounds weird, but that's kind of how this one's going to go. And so the idea here is to make something with a lot of complex joinery, a lot of small detailed bits so that any errors you make really do stand out. So the goal here is to just take it nice and slow and really focus on the project at hand. You'll notice if you've been around the fine woodworking community, checked it out on Instagram, Pinterest, whatever, that these small hanging cabinets are quite a common thing. And so before I really get into my furniture making career, I really wanted to get into making one of these cabinets for myself. Really just focusing on that joinery, getting everything down to the perfect fit, or as best as I can do at this point in time. So one of the best things about this project is this trick that I've learned over the past few months of ripping or stripping down eight quarter stock and gluing it up into these side panels. Now what this does is gives you a nice straight grain style that is just unbeatable. It mimics quarter sawn walnut in a lot of ways, which living in Alberta here, I don't have access to quarter sawn walnut. So this is a really nice secondary option. And you can see just how nice those panels look, even in the raw form. And so at this stage, we're just roughing out the panels, getting everything down to its rough size so that then I can go in and cut out the joinery. Now, all that really matters here is that everything is as square as possible. So again, I really need to take my time because this will affect what I do later on. It's hard to cut joinery when your pieces aren't squared. So taking the time to focus and concentrate on what I'm doing here really matters. And so now we get on to the part that everyone loves, the joinery. So uh, for this one, for all four corners, I went with through dovetails, which comparatively through dovetails are one of the easier joints you can do. There's nothing really complex about them other than the obvious complexity of cutting a dovetail. But what, from what I've found through a few months here of trying to cut dovetails is that it really just takes a little bit of time and patience paying attention to where you're laying out your lines, paying attention to what you're marking out and what you're supposed to be cutting can really affect how well you do. If you just start going crazy, you're never gonna get a good result. But if you take the time to lay out your lines and really carefully cut to your lines, you'll be able to get a really good result. And I know here it looks like I have a lot of expensive tools for this, but in reality, they're not that expensive. All you really need is a couple chisels, a decent little handsaw, and you're good to go. And a mox advice. A mox advice definitely helps. Probably one of the most useful things in my opinion. And so one of the best parts about hand cut dovetails is just how close together you can get the tails. In fact, that's one of the things I really like to do, and as I get better, I'd like to get them really as close as I possibly can, because it's one of those things that shows that they're hand cut. There's a lot of other little tips and tricks you can do to show that they're hand cut, you know, leaving the marking lines in, all that. But the big thing is definitely how close your tails are together really defines how or whether or not they were hand cut. And so fitting up the dovetails is such a fun process because you really just, you get close with the saw and then it's all about going in with the square and just double checking that everything is lining up perfectly putting the panel on, taking it off, and just working until you get there. And so with the main case, the joinery cut, then we move on to the rest of it. So within the case, we have three different shelves. The bottom two are gonna be supporting drawers. And so to make them a little bit easier than uh, well, compared to do anything else, I made them a frame and panel design, which makes it life so much easier because you really can just glue them up and stick them in. Whereas the top panel is a normal panel. It just sits in there floating. And so to make the frames for the bottom two shelves, I use this tenoning jig to cut, uh, to cut bridle joints. And again, bridle joints are one of my favorite joints for applications like this. I think they ended up looking really cool and they're just so simple to make that they really are an unbeatable joint for something like this. And so cleaning it up with the hand plane again gives you a perfect fit inside of the cabinet. And so same thing on the top shelf, I just went and smoothed it all down with my hand plane because as much as possible, I like to try and finish all of my stuff with the hand plane. Uh, I think that it just gives the best possible result. 
And so then to cut the grooves that these, these shelves are gonna sit in, I was gonna use my router and a little dado jig. Because I don't want these dados to go all the way through to the front edge, I need to make sure they were stopped. And the only way to do that is with the router. And so using this jig, I just cut a nice simple quarter inch groove or dado, <laughs> you gotta use the right terminology there, across the panel. And then I could go in and start to finish everything up with the hand plane and prepare it for finish. And so the only thing you have to be careful of here is not to take too much material off the inside of your top and bottom pieces just because that will affect your dovetails. Then I can go in and apply a good coat of tried and true varnish oil. Now anytime I'm doing cabinets like this, I like to pre-finish just because it helps cl making clean up on the inside of the cabinet a little bit easier. It helps glue not to stick in there and it's just a really hard thing to try and finish the inside of a closed cabinet just because it's hard to reach in and get all the corners accurately. And wrapping a little bit of green tape around the dovetails and the pins can help you prevent getting oil on those areas. Now for this glue up, I'm just using Type Bond 2, which is more than strong enough for this application. Again, really you're just using it to tack the dovetails together. The actual shape of the dovetails is what's doing most of the holding power. And so for all three of the shelves, I wanted to make sure that they were flush with the front edge, at least at this stage. So I went in and just cut a small, simple notch on the front corner so that they would actually line up with the front edge. Then I could go in and choose how much relief I want on the front edge. I think on most of them I went with about an eighth of an inch, so they're just, just slightly inset into the inside of the cabinet. Then it was time to work on the back panel. So for this back panel, I'm using Cortisone Fur, which is a very interesting wood. I've never really seen it before. I've never really heard of anyone using it. So I was kind of excited to try this piece out. Now this stuff, for what it is, is very expensive, but I do think that it looks great. Uh, it's a very beautiful wood. It's a little bit on the bright orange side for me, but I do think that I will try this again in the future. I still have a decent amount of it sitting around. I haven't done a whole lot with it, but I am ex I do think that it works and blends really well with walnut. And so the hanging mechanism for this cabinet is going to be just a simple French cleat. Normally I wouldn't make these out of walnut, but because I had so much scrap laying around, I just went for it. Then it came time to do the drawer fronts. So this is probably the part I was most afraid of. Because this is such a complex thing to do, fitting a, getting a nice piston fit on the drawer fronts, I really took a lot of time to focus on cutting the dovetails nice and true. And so on the front of the drawers, I did half blind dovetails. Now this is my first time successfully doing half blind dovetails. Uh, that's in practices and everything. Every other time I've tried to do them, I've always blown out the front edge. So again, focusing on what I was doing here, working with very sharp tools, and just trying my best to not have any issues, and I got very lucky. I, I can chalk it up to a little bit of skill, but mostly luck. And while well, the back of the drawers, because there's nothing super complex or not gonna be visible, I just went with true dovetails just to make it a little bit easier. But I'm super glad that I did do half-blind dovetails on here because I think it was such a good practice for projects that I will be doing in the future. Uh, and doing it in that small size, again, it just looks really good. And so with the drawers all glued up, I could then go in and clean them up to get that nice piston fit so that when you push them in, they kind of stick in. And then to perfectly accentuate these drawers, I put on some nice Horton Brasses knobs. So these are solid brass knobs, by the way, which I absolutely love. Then it was time to put the final piece in. So above the, or in the middle section of this, I wanted to have a tray. Now this is a thing I built, I built a couple of these tea cabinets before and I really like putting these trays in the middle section because it makes it, it's such a cool idea because you have that exposed frame and panel shelf right below it 
And you can either fill that shelf or you can put in a tray like this. So this is where you would theoretically keep the teapot or some cups or whatever serving utensils you have, you know, a sugar dish, whatever it may be. And so it makes it really easy that when you want to, when it comes to the tea time, you can just pull this tray out and go ahead and serve it. And so this is a nice simple tray utilizing the table saw for all the joinery. For this tray, I made sure to make it a little bit oversized and then plane it down to thickness. Then with all of my components together, I could then go in and apply finish to the rest of the cabinet. So again, using tried and true varnish oil, this is probably one of my favorite finishes over all of our areas, a nice liberal amount, making sure to get it all nice and oil soaked so that it'll have a good long time of protection. And just like that, the cabinet is now completed. So we've got oil and finish over all areas of this thing. Everything is dried now and it looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, I was gonna do a part where I hung this up on a wall, but I don't currently have a wall in my house where I can actually put this thing. 